All right, we're continuing in our uh, small group discussion series. The title of the series is Understanding and Obeying the Ten Commandments. And this is lesson number three uh, in that series. And the title of this lesson is Idol and Likeness. So as I said, we're studying the Ten Commandments with the objective of truly understanding them and more perfectly obeying them as a way of growing in sanctification in Christ Jesus. Now, as I said uh, in the past, um, the commandments are what put Jesus on the cross. They are what brings sinners to the cross and they are what keep Christians at the cross. So if I was to summarize what we've learned so far, I think this is a good summary right there. So we're going to go into the second commandment uh, found in Exodus chapter 20, verses four to six. Now, I want you to note here that um, this commandment, uh, there is a prohibition and there are consequences, not just the thou shalt not, but also what happens if you break the commandment. Um, and this commandment, the second commandment, addresses the mode of worship, not the object of worship. First commandment um, um, uh, talked about who we were to worship. The second commandment talks about how we are to worship that um, um, worship God. So uh, we begin in verse four, Exodus chapter 20, verse four, and it says, you shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. So note that the command doesn't just say kneel or you have to pray to this, but it actually says you mustn't make such things. You, you mustn't make things that become the object of your uh, devotion. Uh, for example, an idol is a, uh, is a man-made object that represents what man thinks or imagines what God is like. That's what an idol is. And a likeness is a, an object in the creation uh, that you use to represent God. And so in verse five, uh, it says, you shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. So notice here, it says, you shall not create or make these things. And he gives various uh, various reasons. Don't make these type of things for the following reasons. First, he says, for worship purposes. So uh, to, to, to offer devotion or prayer or trust or love to these objects and what you think they represent, don't do that. The worship or reverence of Mary or the saints as represented by pictures or statues this is a form of idolatry. I know some people you know, would feel offended hearing that, but you know, in, in light of this command here, you know, the command says, don't make images of what you think God is like. Don't make images uh, or objects that you will use to represent who you think God is or who is holy. And also for serving purposes, to serve as a priest or a disciple in temples or shrines, uh, that have these things, don't, don't do that, the commandment says. You know, a lot of people say that they don't worship the statue. You know, they say, oh, there's a statue of a saint or statue of Mary or statue of something. You know, they say, well, I'm, I'm not really worshiping the statue. I, I'm worshiping what the statue represents. And they think, oh, you know, that makes sense. But the second commandment clearly says that we must not even use a statue or an image in worshiping God. You know, the, the, the only object that helps us in worshiping God is this, is, is His Word. Because in His Word we find you know, out who He is and how He is and how He wants us to approach Him. What heart we need to have and, and the mindset that we need to develop in order to uh, approach and worship Him in a, in a proper way. Then in verses five and six, the writer uh, talks about the uh, consequences in verse five, it says, you shall not worship them or serve them for I, the Lord, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. 
And so the commandment says that God will punish those who break this command. It's a promise. You can't do this with impunity. And if you teach your children these things, they also will be punished and the punishment will occur in every generation that this sin is practiced without exception. We know that religious values, religious ideas tend to be passed on from one generation to the other. This is what this commandment is addressing here. Those, however, who obey the command will set into motion a faith that can be blessed and can be multiplied. The idea here is that the effects of disobedience last perhaps a few generations until those people are cut off altogether or they change. But obedience guarantees life for people and uh, even into, uh, you know, for a thousand generations. God will not cut off those who, who obey His command. So how do uh, people break this command? And we, we've seen a lot of examples of this in the in the Old Testament, you know, uh, you know, the worship of Baal, for example, uh, by the pagan tribe, by the Canaanites, you know, Baal was a, actually a local god. Each city had their Baal god. You know. That's why there are so many different names you know, in the Bible for the various uh, Baal deities that existed. Some people uh, pronounce it, by the way, Baal or Baal. Either way, you know what I'm talking about. And uh, among the Jews, uh, they worshiped the golden calf in the, in the, in the wilderness. Uh, they created objects to worship or to offer uh, worship to. Um, and we saw that with Aaron you know, making the calf and people you know, making offerings to it. The Egyptians, you know, another uh, pagan gods that they worshiped. Uh, they worshiped the sun, they worshiped, they worshiped the, the river, objects in creation that they had deified. Um, in the New Testament, or in the, in the New Testament period, we live in the New Testament period, how do non-Christians uh, disobey this command in the, in the modern time? Well, in the you know, New Testament uh, period. Well, the same type of Old Testament idolatry exists today in various uh, religions. I mean, Hindus burn fire before statues, and Muslims, uh, one of their uh, rituals that uh, is to uh, go on pilgrimage and go to Mecca and you know, touch uh, the sacred stone at, uh, at Mecca. Uh, and the statue of Buddha is, is revered. Even in the West, we have examples of this. The Mormon, uh, Mormon religion, they, they consider their temples uh, as sacred things. Uh, Roman Catholicism still uses imagery in worship and in, in devotion, still plenty of statues in Catholic churches. And then of course, even non-quote religion, uh, religious uh, people, uh, environmentalists, for example, consider the earth as sacred and, and they serve it as a person uh, serves God. And then there's the practice of occultism and witchcraft and sorcery and divination. All these things are form of idolatry because they seek and they serve a spiritual power that is not from God. There is spiritual power out there, uh, but not all of it is, is, is from God. Um, a trickier question is how do Christians, how do believers fall you know, into the trap of, of disobeying this command uh, in the modern times? Well, aside from being subject to these things, Christians can also be caught up in idolatry in the following ways. Uh, one way is the resistance to God's will and God's word. You know, in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 15, uh, Saul, the King Saul, disobeyed Samuel, uh, Samuel's instructions regarding the destruction of the Amalekites. And when he was corrected by Samuel, Samuel the prophet, the judge, um, Saul continued to justify his behavior. We read about that in, in 1 Samuel chapter 15. In this we see an individual resisting the spirit or the direct word of God. And this is a form of idolatry because it establishes our will and our thoughts and our image of self as supreme over us. You know, in this day and time, it's the attitude that says, nobody's going to tell me what to do. Really? Yeah, not even God. I'm the boss of me. Well, that's idolatry. I'm the boss of me means I and the object of worship. I am the object of service and not God. Well, that's a form of 
idolatry, extreme pride, ego, egoism. That's a, that's a form of I, idolatry. We end up serving our own will above God's will. Another way is through greed. In Colossians chapter three, Paul writes, therefore consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. So Paul warns that greed, and greed is the unsatiable desire for more. You know, I say often, you know, it's not just rich people who are who are greedy. Some people think, wow, rich people are greedy. No, poor people are greedy too because greed is not just you know, having money or having you know, possessions. Greed is never being satisfied with what you have. That's greed. And Paul says that that attitude is a form of, of idolatry. Greed moves us to set up the satisfaction of our desire as our God. So what's your God? Your God is satisfying your desires, that's your God, that's idolatry. We focus our energy and love uh, on the people and the things and the positions that we desire. We lavish our love and attention on them when we get them. Greed, however, keeps us in a never ending cycle of yearning, earning, and yearning again. You know, I yearn for something, I finally buy it, get it, you know, and then, uh, I want something else beyond that. Never, never being satisfied. This world is full of temptation to idolatry because it offers us many alternatives, alternatives rather, to God's word as the basis for living. And we're constantly stimulated to be dissatisfied with what we have and yearn for more or yearn for newer, whether it be laundry detergent or a new spouse. We're, we always want more, we always want different. We're always encouraged to desire more or different than what we already have. That's what happens in, in, the, uh, in the world. And that is a form of idolatry. Uh, the next section is how to better obey this particular command. How do we do that? It's not, not easy. One way is to keep our eyes and our heart focused on Christ. Uh, another passage in Colossians 1 verse 15, Paul writes, he, meaning Christ, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And so how, how, do, we, how, do, we, how do we better obey this command? Well, keep, keep our eyes focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian, obviously. Uh, prayer, worship, study, service to Christ. These things guarantee that we will know and serve the true God and will walk in his ways. The more we know, the more we see Christ, the more we know and see the Father. For if you've seen Christ, you've seen the Father, Jesus says in John chapter 14, uh, verse nine. The more we know Christ, the less likely we will fall into idolatry and worship another, including sinful self. Secondly, be content with what you have. Be content with what you have. The Hebrew writer writes in Hebrews 13, make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? So the antidote to greed is contentment. And the way to contentment has three steps. First, recognize that all you have is from God. You didn't produce it, and without his blessings you would not have acquired it. This is true whether a person acknowledges it or not. You know, the fact that I have a home, and I have a, a family, I have a car, I have a job, you know, the fact that I have all these things is because God gave these things to me. He allowed me to possess them. Sure, I may have worked and done this and that, but you know what, a lot of people work hard and they don't have a lot of things, for example. So uh, I have to recognize first and foremost that God is the source of all my blessings. If I want to uh, you know, learn how to be uh, content, that's the first step. Where do all my blessings come from? Where do, where do all the good things in my life come from? Well, they come from God. I need to recognize that. Secondly, we need to um, um, uh, practice giving thanks. Um, the giving of thanks to God is what sanctifies or what purifies 
um, for our use the things that we have. First Timothy chapter four, verse four. Being and showing our gratitude for what we have neutralizes the temptation to constantly yearn for more or newer. When I, when I begin to feel dissatisfied, you know, we, we, all, you know, we all go through that from time to time, but when I begin to feel dissatisfied you know, or uh, pity, you know, self-pity, oh, I wish I had this, or boy, I don't know if I quite made it here, and, or I see someone that excels in an area where I don't excel, and, and, and begin to you know, fall into that trap of yearning for something more, the way that I get out of that cycle is I begin listing and giving thanks for all the things that God has given me. And I mean, nothing is too small for me to give thanks for. You know, uh, I, I often use the example, you should give thanks that you're able to blink, <laughs> right? We don't even think about blinking. Blinking, you know, and moisture helps keep our eyes clean and moist and so on and so on. But imagine if you couldn't blink Imagine if that thing in your brain that, 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 that allows you to blink and you know, take care of your eyes that way, that, that it didn't work properly. Uh, all the trouble that you would have, wouldn't be able to see or read, would have to constantly put, you know, some people have that problem. I give thanks that you know, my eyes blink, they work. My voice works, my mouth works. I'm able to eat all kinds of food. I mean, the list of things that I have that to, to be thankful for is endless. And so when I'm beginning to fall into you know, that little cycle of self-pity and yearning for something new or, you know, I stop myself and my prayer is, Lord, uh, please remind me of the things that I have that I need to be grateful for. And then thirdly, we need to uh, trust God's portion. Trust God's portion. God knows both what you need and how much you need even before you realize it. Greed moves us to search for and acquire more than what we need and thus reject God's will in this area of our lives. Very important idea. God sets boundaries around us for, you know, in different areas and we need to learn to respect those boundaries. This is why people can't satisfy themselves with more or bigger or newer. Satisfaction comes from accepting and doing God's will. Satisfaction comes from accepting the boundaries that God has placed upon us in, in various ways. And so to obey the second commandment regarding idolatry, let's keep our focus on the Lord, number one, and two, let's learn to be content with what we have. All right, so that's our, uh, that's our preliminary lesson. Here are the questions that you can use for your small group uh, discussion. Question number one, what idols have been most prevalent in your life? Question number two, some think that having a cross in the church building is idolatrous. Do you agree? Why? Question number three, what prevents you from having a steady and clear focus on Christ? Question number four, why is contentment so difficult to achieve and easy to lose? Question number five, what is the hardest thing to trust God with in your life? 